Hello, this is Cynthia Sue Larson with RealityShifters.com. Today I'm talking with you about being an optimal attractor in chaotic times. My focusing question today is, is it possible to bring peace to troubled situations, thereby improving outcomes? And if so, can this occur simply through our presence? The reason I'm asking a focusing question is because it's part of this whole concept of a participatory universe. This idea was first formulated scientifically by John Archibald Wheeler, an American physicist. And with his concept, we can ask a question, nature will answer. This is also the basis of the reason that I ask the question and encourage everyone to ask the question, how good can it get? And I do mean to ask that question in any circumstances, wherever you may be, whatever attitude, whatever thoughts you're having, whatever feelings you're experiencing, because that question can has the capability of helping pull you up by the bootstraps. <laughs> if you're already doing pretty well, it'll go better. It takes the limits that we sometimes assume to exist off of the Creator, off of the Divine, and it gives us a limitless concept of good, which is not boring by any stretch of the imagination, quite the opposite. So. That's what's behind this radical optimism that I'm constantly espousing, basically. It's founded in this idea that we are asking questions, whether they're conscious or subconscious. We can retrain the kind of questions that we're asking. And so that's the whole idea there. But getting back into this primary focusing question today, I'm going to repeat it again. Is it possible to bring peace to troubled situations, thereby improving outcomes? And if so, can this occur simply through our presence? So those are questions that have been on my mind for some time, and they've really sprung to the forefront, the front burner, this last month. And I'd like to bring up a video that was done by my colleague, and this is Melissa, <laughs> Melinda Iverson in, speaking with Dr. Patrick McManaway on the Wisdom Keepers channel on YouTube. And there's a video there, Love, Rapport, and compassion. There's a link in the description to this video, so you can check it out. But um, what came up in that interview, fantastic conversation, I recommend watching the whole thing, is that there's a special kind of rapport that occurs in energetic healing. And in this state, healers experience um, this extraordinary vibrational, um, <laughs> I don't even have words for it, it's vibrational healing energy with focused intention. And so when they're doing that, and they have these vibrational spaces that they create and maintain, um, these are very conducive to healing. And this is what, to me, I want to highlight this one little part of their conversation, is where when Dr. McManaway, here's, I'm quoting him now, the person being healed would come out of that state, and after a few minutes, the healer would come out of it. So just in terms of contact, context of understanding, in terms of protocols, or is it really just rapport? That was instructive to me, just to see it was literally a vibrational space that the healer was holding, that the person was then able to phase and train with. I guess would be our contemporary language. And in that phase and trained grace state, everything goes with that, and the job was done. That would be the healing job that he's talking about. So while I was working on writing this post, I was giving that a lot of thought because really, I've worked with clients so many times and it seems like most of what I do is enter into that very supportive, very high vibratory focused intentional state of being grounded and energized with a tremendous positive intention. And it seems to me that that alone is certainly necessary. It also seems to be sufficient for assisting people to um, have these light bulb moments, these aha inspirational moments, as well as to clear a, a large number of issues. Um, I'm not going to go into what, but it's, that would be a volumes and volumes. But basically, when I work with people one on one, we do experience this together. We experience the beautiful power of presence. And this is even when working over the internet through screens, like via um, internet chat and so forth, video chat. Uh, most people don't seem to be aware of the immense power that we all have with our presence. And it's huge. It's so much bigger than, than you've probably ever recognized in yourself. I think we take ourselves a little bit too much for granted. 
And we think that wherever our attitude goes with us, it's no big deal because that's just us. But if we think of it, if we give as much attention to our energy state and our intentional focus as we do our makeup, our clothes, um, and so forth, our outer appearance, um, that would be a good thing. Now, one of the my background trainings is in martial arts. I've studied something called Kuk Sul Wan, which is a Korean, very comprehensive martial art. And our grandmaster is currently still alive and um, in Hyuksa. And he's um, such an embodiment of the principle of something called Jung Shin. Now, Jung Shin is a very harmonious state of being. And it's this harmonious um, mindset. If you've been watching my videos, then you know I'm frequently talking about aligning levels of conscious agency within ourselves. Our head, we've got neurons here. Our heart, we have neurons here. And our gut, guess what? Neurons are in the gut. So most of us think, uh, we've been biased to think that where the neurons are, that's where the brain is. Sure, yes, we have a brain where the neurons are. We also have a brain in the heart. And we have a brain in the gut. And to those of us who study energy the way I do, and these levels of conscious agency like I do, you'll start noticing from a mystical sense and standpoint, there are higher levels of conscious agency as well. And these exist outside our physical body, yet very much within the domain of our true identity, the one that we take with us wherever we go, the one that's in our dream state. Um, it's what we train for and practice, some of us, in meditations, so that when we make a transition to the next world, we still have that core identity. That's the one I'm talking about. So within that context, this Jung Shin idea, it demands and demonstrates a principle of respect through etiquette, through manners. And it's necessary, of course, when you're training in martial arts, because anything that you're doing could potentially damage someone. And so it's requisite um, training to include what may seem um, unessential, these areas that definitely get into integrity, into respect, into harmonious alignment with self to the highest levels of being. And when we do that, what's extraordinary about the Jung Shin concept is that um, it confers phenomenal, you might call it luck or fortune, but I'd call it Jung Shin spirit. You know, but Jung Shin is the best description. And what that is, uh, it's a quality that can bring victory to even the least experienced martial artist or least experienced game player, least experienced anything. If you have correct Jung Shin, that harmonious alignment, then with that integrity and that state of mind, it's well recognized that opponents, even with superior technique, experience, strength, and skill, can be overcome. And that is why it's so important for all of us in this age of chaos, when it seems to many people like, what is going on? I can't fathom it. I don't understand the context anymore. Um, this is the core foundation that we're bringing with our presence. We can thus be the peace and love that we wish to find in the world. We can make our minds so still like the water and I'm going to read a quote from Yeats. And this quote came to me when I was working on this blog post, and I was wishing for a quote. I just wanted something that would really evoke this idea that when you bring peace to the chaos, the chaos can respond by becoming, by becoming more orderly. And here's a quote by W.B. Yeats that was sent to me by a friend through the email. Here it is. We can make our minds so like still water that beings gather about us that they may see it may be their own images and live for a moment with a clearer perhaps even with a fiercer life because of our quiet our silence so this idea that yates describes can be adopted and experimented with anytime you wish to see what kind of a difference you might notice when you bring yourself and your presence to the world you can bring this into your relationships with others you can bring it into any experience that you undertake. And make it an experiment by, especially if it's something you do quite often, bring more peace from this um, inner silence, inner stillness. You can do a meditation for stillness and silence beforehand, and bring that into the experience, and just pay attention to what happens next. Of course, I would recommend it. Keep asking how good can it get. This brings us to the idea of chaos itself. What is chaos? And what is this butterfly effect we've heard about? So 
In a perfect world, we might not need to deal with chaos, one would think, um, but we do need to bring with, deal with chaos. Chaos itself comes from the word, um, the etymology comes from the Greek, I think it's chaos, the same pronunciation, K-H-O-A-O-S, and it means abyss, that which gapes wide open, that which is vast and empty. Our modern day interpretation of chaos, of course, is something like utter confusion, right? And that idea arose around the year 1600. It was taken from the concept of the void at the beginning of creation, the confused, formless, elementary state of <laughs> sort of like the beginning of the core of the universe. Now, this core chaos theory that I've been studying myself, and I've written a paper about it with complexity and chaos, and quantum physics. Um, around 1977, chaos theory was born, and that introduced an idea that there exist mathematical patterns and structures within chaos, and these have practical applications. Chaos theory has grown since 1977, and, and now it's an interdisciplinary branch of mechanics and mathematics, and it studies apparently random or unpredictable behavior. And these are systems that are governed by deterministic laws, which was amazing. And this is where people were first stunned to see that um, a very small change in a system, this is the butterfly effect now, something very tiny, like a butterfly flapping its wings in one part of the world, can have a huge effect on the entire system, much greater than it should have any right to, um, based on previously held assumptions and theories. An example of this butterfly effect can be seen in an error that occurred accidentally back in 1989. There was a spokesman named Gunter Schabowski, and he had the job of reading official notices. So one evening, I think, he was just reading this notice. It's kind of a boring notice. I don't think he was fully prepared. Anyway, what happened next is um, he was supposed to announce there had been a major change in how people could visit the Berlin Wall, such that as long as East Germans applied for permissions or permits, they could now visit the West. This notice was difficult for Schabowski to understand when he's just going on in the air and reading it. Um, so when a reporter asked him, when will these new rules take effect? Schabowski replied, immediately. Uh, based on that little flapping of the butterfly wings, the word immediately was interpreted by the listeners of that broadcast that that meant now. And so there was such a rush of people that descended upon the Berlin Wall that the wall was effectively gone right after that announcement was made, much faster than I'm sure the officials meant it to be. So this brings us to back to our focus today of our question. How can we achieve optimal flow of events? How can we attract those? Now that we've heard about the power of our presence, these ideas of conscious agency, and we're like a layer cake. We've got stacks and stacks of levels of conscious agency within ourselves got our head, our heart, our gut. We've got higher levels, definitely. How do we work with all this, with this idea of deterministic chaos, where things can sometimes form patterns, and something called an attractor can have such an effect that it brings a system that seems unpredictable into recognizable patterns that might be ones that we would wish to see. So um, this idea of attractor within chaos theory is an end point toward which a system tends to evolve from a wide variety of possible starting conditions. These attractors are capable of disrupting even large systems in dramatic fashion, contributing to sudden shifts into entirely new states of being. Now, if you ever watched or read books by um, stories by Isaac Asimov, he's written quite a few and he's passed on now. But he wrote some books called the Foundation Series, and I'm going to bring that up because it's very interesting. He has a lead character, the protagonist of the Foundation books, named Harry Selden, and that was a man who scientifically was capable of predicting the behavior of wide sweeping events going forward through generations and many, many years involving human populations over centuries. And he was using a field of mathematics that's fictitious, it's from science fiction, but he invented it in the story, and it's called psychohistory. Now, when Selden predicts doom and failure for the galactic empire, he's predicting that art and science and all levels of civilization will collapse. And so um, 
they're going to just be gone unless somebody or something does something to protect them. So in order to help preserve the best that humanity has to offer, Harry Seldon establishes the Foundation as a kind of planet university to help provide humanity with inspiration, protection, and guidance during a time of crises to assist civilization in rising again. And if you've been watching the show on uh, um, Netflix called Ancient Apocalypse, you might be familiar with the fact that apparently our human civilization is not as young as some people would have us believe. I mean, Westerners would have us believe. Obviously, if you've been following my work, then you know I've been talking about indigenous native people who do say that the world has come and gone. We're in the fourth world and is going to end and we're going to go into the fifth world. In other words, these cycles of crises are regular, like a heartbeat on the planet. They've occurred before that every, you know, specified number of tens of thousands of years later, it's happening. So um, you can check that out if you're interested. But for our purpose today, I'd like us to focus on how we might see possible future attractors or see ourselves even as possible future attractors capable of pulling order out of chaos. And how would this work? And might we be the attractors that we're looking for? <laughs> yeah, I think by the question you can tell my bias is yes, I think we can be and we need to be. So the shape of everything that is self-sustaining, such as deterministic chaos attractors, can be seen in something called toroidal fractals. Now a, toro a toroid or a torus looks like this. Hold it up. It's kind of a shape, looks like a, a donut. And that donut shape is basically the same shape that you'll see when you look at the human energy field. We've got a donut torus, tor toroid toroidal field going around us, kind of like the north and south poles of the, around the planet. Every single one of our chakras also has a toroidal field. And so what's so amazing about these self-sustaining um, deterministic chaos attractors is that um, consciousness itself seems to be uh, very friendly and very fond of these sorts of toroids. So we can therefore see ourselves as a focus point of positivity, even amidst chaos. And we can do it simply by knowing that we are in a participatory universe. Every thought, every question that we enthuse and um, energize with our own emotional sense of um, need and love and just in to totally keen, laser sharp, attentional focus can therefore be given to us when that's the focus of what we're asking for. So simply by asking how good can it get, nature can answer. When we simply ask how can we best bring peace into what seems like chaotic times, how can we best ensure the smoothest possible transition into the fifth world, we can then experience the answer to that question, both individually and collectively for all of us. So until next time, I hope you'll keep asking my favorite question, of course. I've mentioned it today. <laughs> How good can it get? And I would love to see that happen for each and every one of you and for everyone and everything you love. Collectively, we are the change we're looking for. We are the attractors bringing order out of the chaos. We are creating the foundation based on this direct connection to our spiritual source through these higher and higher levels of conscious agency. So love you lots, take care, and bye-bye for now.